The year is 2003. A brand new Zelda game has just released and you can't wait to get home from school or work to get your hands on it. Boasting a whimsical art style and a vast open sea, this game immediately captured many people's hearts as one of their most beloved games in the entire Zelda series. The Wind Waker is the third 3D Zelda game after Ocarina of Time and Majora's Mask, taking the next big leap forward for the series into the next generation by releasing on the Nintendo GameCube. <laughs> The concept for what a Zelda game should be was still not solidified at this point, leading to many innovative ideas, artistic approaches, and developmental designs. The Master Sword is one major example of this, as it still wasn't set in stone for how it should physically look, leading to the legendary blade very loosely resembling its previous iterations. With so many things still up in the air about what truly gave a Zelda game its own identity at the time, there were bound to be several developmental decisions made with the Wind Waker that unintentionally caused some friction with later games in the series down the road. One of these controversial decisions has sparked fierce debates for over two entire decades. Even today, you will still frequently find people arguing over the implications and contradictions of this single decision. The decision I'm talking about is, of course, the extremely odd evolution of the Zora into the Rito. Almost everyone can agree that it's genuinely pretty weird and doesn't really make a lot of sense just simply turning a race of fish people into bird people. While The Wind Waker does contain several fragments of lore that helps us to better understand the reasoning behind this decision, it still didn't quite satisfy the masses. Fast forwarding to 2017, Hyrule Encyclopedia was released and it gave us a little more insight into the evolution of the Zora into the Rito. The book claims that the water flooding Hyrule is not normal water, it is apparently ethereal water because it fell from the heavens, thus nothing but monsters and fishmen can survive in it. This is further backed up by the fact that Ganondorf claims there are no fish to catch in these waters. The Zora, not being able to survive in this ethereal sea, were forced to adapt in order to continue their existence in this new world. This information along with the fact that Hyrule Historia also officially established the timeline in which it gave the Wind Waker its own branch away from the other games in the series was enough to satisfy people for a while. Until Breath of the Wild came out at least. Now we have both the Zora and the Rito coexisting within the same game, which reignited many passionate debates. Now, how on earth could this be possible? Up until now, there have been countless conversations on how this could make sense, but thanks to Tears of the Kingdom, I'm about to finally put an end to all of the endless speculation. This is the theory that will finally solve, I hope, the seemingly impossible existence of the Zora and the Rito in Breath of the Wild and Tears of the Kingdom. So please, sit back, relax, and let's get started. King Dorafan, the ruler of the Zora in Breath of the Wild, commissioned several inscribed stone monuments to be placed in various locations within the domain in order to preserve the history of the Zora for many long years. Unfortunately, some of these monuments were beginning to show significant signs of degradation, rendering them almost impossible to read. To address this issue, in Tears of the Kingdom, King Dorafan instructed his son, Prince Sidon, to recommission the restoration of these stone monuments, and overwrite them with tales of his own. While the majority of the new dialogue is told from Sidon's personal perspective, such as memorable childhood moments, rather than recounting historical events, some of the information we can learn from these new inscriptions further elaborates on the tales King Dorafan once told. According to the stone monument, Learnings of the Zora, Part 2, Prince Sidon recollects the story of an ancient Zoran princess named Rudo, who confronted an evil man alongside a legendary hero and the princess of Hyrule. This is of course referring to Ocarina of Time, but Sidon goes further. He then states, As Princess Rudo's descendant, it is my fate to carry the torch of her brave acts into tomorrow and beyond. This sentence struck me to the core the moment I read the word descendant. The choice of words used here are incredibly important. To be of royal descent can be a generalized way of saying that your heritage contained royalty at some point in the past. It doesn't necessarily mean that your bloodline specifically contains royal blood. To claim to be the descendant of someone means that you are genetically connected to that person with roots that will lead directly back to them. What Sidon is saying here is that he is indeed the result of Princess Rudo bearing children, which inevitably led to his conception. She is literally his ultra-grandmother, to put it in simpler terms. 
King Dorofan confirms the fact that his family does indeed have royal blood, thanks to him telling Sidon that the throne is not guaranteed to be ascended by him, and that someone without royal blood could very well become the next king. This has massive implications. So massive, in fact, that I think this one sentence alone just solved some of the biggest questions in the history of Zelda, potentially including the placement of Breath of the Wild and Tears of the Kingdom on the timeline. It even confirms the fact that not all sages died in Ocarina of Time, maybe none of them died at all, which has been a heavily debated topic. But how is Sidon Rudo's descendant in the first place? I am so glad you asked. Let's begin by shifting our focus back into the Wind Waker, and I'll explain everything. Before the events of the Wind Waker, Ganondorf broke free from his seal, but was left unopposed by any hero. Because of this, the king gathered the seven sages, and together he conducted a song with them using the Wind Waker to call upon the gods for salvation. In response, the gods told the king to select groups of people that would ascend to the highest mountaintops in order to survive the oncoming downpour of ethereal water from the heavens. The kingdom of Hyrule was flooded, and Ganondorf along with the king was sealed once more beneath the Great Sea. Among the groups of people who survived the flood were the Zora. Left without a body of water to call home, drastic measures had to be taken if they wished to thrive. The gods most likely foresaw this happening, so to prevent the Zora from suffering, they commanded Valu, the spirit of the skies, to watch over the Zora and protect them. By obtaining a scale from Valu, the Zora rapidly evolved into the bird-like Rito, abandoning their need for water and adopting their new domain, the sky. This evolution process was most likely not instantaneous. If we closely examine Komali, the Rito chieftain's son, before he obtains a scale from Valu to receive his wings, we can notice some very striking differences between now and after he obtains his wings. His beak is very undefined and dark, almost matching the tone of his skin, while his legs have yet to become digitigrade. The hair on the back of his head is also a dark brown, but this could be a visual hint at Komali still growing out of his fledgling stage. After he receives his wings, his beak is now a vibrant yellow with defined front-facing nostrils as well as his legs becoming digitigrade, and his hair is now fully white. These are pretty significant changes that the Rito undergo simply by receiving a scale from Balu. Because Komali looked like he still retained some traits of human-like characteristics from being a Zora, I'm willing to bet that when the Zora first received their scales from Valu, the first significant evolution they underwent was the ability to thrive better on land, but no physical alterations. After several generations of passing down their altered DNA to their kin and the following generations obtaining their own scales from Valu, I can see how they slowly turned into the Rito tribe after doing this for several hundred years. This could also explain how they look entirely bird-like in Breath of the Wild and Tears of the Kingdom. They just simply kept evolving generation after generation, slowly but surely losing their old Zoran characteristics entirely. But how is any of this relevant to Prince Sidon and Princess Rudo? If the Zora all evolved into the Rito, then how can Sidon be the direct descendant of Rudo? I'll tell you how. Not all of the Zora evolved into the Rito. Remember when I said that the gods told the king to select groups of people to ascend to the mountaintops before the flood? I think I might know exactly what happened at this moment. Rudo, being the queen of the Zora at the time, which I will elaborate on in due time, came up with a plan. She told the king that she will split her people into three groups and leave Hyrule with one of those groups in order to establish a new Zora's domain in foreign livable bodies of water. All three groups would receive the first blessing of Valu scales in order to survive longer without water. In Twilight Princess, we find Prince Rallus in a critical state due to being out of water for only a short amount of time which was simply traveling from Zora's domain to Hyrule Castle, so we know in other timelines that they can't survive for very long on land. One group of Zora would accompany Rudo. The second group of Zora would depart for Dragon Roost Island, which was kindly given to the Zora by the Gorons, since it used to be their home, Death Mountain. The Gorons are not bothered by water, thanks to information we can discover in Twilight Princess, so they're able to make just about anywhere they go their new home. It could also explain why they appear to be traveling vagabonds in the Wind Waker. The third and final group of Zora remained on Great Fish Isle, which used to be Lake Hylia. This explains why Jabun, the patron deity of the Zora, and Jabu Jabu's descendant is originally found on Great Fish Isle before Ganondorf destroyed and cursed it. It is said that the Great Fish Isle used to be inhabited by Hyruleans, not Hylians specifically, but any citizen of Hyrule. 
Based on the fact that the Great Fish Isle was the highest point in Lake Hylia, which has always been associated with and directly connected to Zora's domain, it's safe to assume that the people who ascended to the highest point in this area were Zora. Jaboon still residing there also helps convey this possibility. Before the island was destroyed during the events of the game by Ganondorf, there very well could have been actual Zora still living on it. One final piece of evidence of the existence of Zora on the Great Fish Isle is found on Windfall Island. In the cafe, the menu has a handful of items for sale, one of them being Zora coffee. Now, unless Zora were still very relevant as their own race, why would you continue to call your product Zora coffee if they all supposedly turned into Rito a long time ago? Why not just call it Rito coffee? So to recap, we have three branches of Zora. One branch separated and evolved into the Rito, accepting Valu as their new patron deity. One branch remained on Great Fish Isle along with Jabun, their original patron deity. One branch departed Hyrule in search of a new place to call home. How am I so sure that Rudo left Hyrule, you ask? Well, thankfully, The Wind Waker received two sequels that answer that question. In both games, you can find many treasures. One of those treasures happens to be Rudo's crown. Yep, this is why I referred to her as Queen Rudo earlier. You can find several of these crowns in these two games, because they're functionally meant to be sold for rupees, giving the player another avenue to increase their wealth, so that they can purchase the many upgrades these games make available. You can also find Zora Scales in Phantom Hourglass, another collectible treasure item. These two games have basically left us a breadcrumb trail to follow. Using this information, we can confirm that Rudo, along with her group of Zora, traveled across the Ocean King's waters and into the seas bordering the continent of New Hyrule. It's unknown whether she continued her journey or not, but the evidence here implies that she did indeed leave the old Hyrule behind. Now that we know what happened to Queen Rudo and how it's possible for the Zora to exist alongside the Rito within the same game, let's take another look at Breath of the Wild and Tears of the Kingdom. Both King Dorofan and Sidon's stone monuments recollect the tale of the founding of Hyrule's Zora's domain. They speak of wandering Zora in search of an abundance of pure, clean water to call their home. They eventually settled in Laneru and carved into the mountains their new kingdom. There's a bit of contradiction going on with Dorofan's story, claiming that Zora's domain was founded 10,000 years ago, when we know that this isn't the case thanks to Tears of the Kingdom very clearly taking place well over 10,000 years ago, potentially even 20 to 30,000 years ago, and yet we see that there were indeed Zora at this point in time. Is it a conflict in storytelling, or is this intentional? Who knows for sure, but what we do know for a fact is that either way, the Zora did come from outside of Hyrule looking for a place to call home at some point. The only Hyrulean race that has ever implied that they were originally outsiders in these games were the Zora. Does this sound familiar to you? The stone monuments also say that once every 10 years, Laneru received unusually heavy rainfall which flooded many rivers, damaging the surrounding regions. Unusually heavy rainfalls, huh? Where have we seen that before? Yona, Sidon's wife, comes from a different Zora's domain, which uses gold and jewelry, confirming the existence of another established Zoran settlement somewhere else outside of Hyrule. Sidon's domain uses silver jewelry. Do you know who else used silver jewelry? Hmm. I'm starting to think that we might finally have enough evidence to start putting together the pieces of the puzzle. Hyrule was flooded in the Wind Waker. The Zora branched off, one of them becoming the Rito, while the other accompanied Queen Rudo and established a new Zora's domain outside of Hyrule. Great Fish Isle, which used to be Lake Hylia, directly connected to the home of the Zora in Ocarina of Time, was cursed with a perpetually dark storm cloud. Ganondorf is defeated, the curse on Great Fish Isle is seemingly gone or at least diminished, so it may take another 10 years for it to reappear. Link and Zelda set off to find new land and rebuild their kingdom. At some point, the ethereal waters of the Great Sea receded, uncovering the original Hyrule. With Hyrule now able to be resettled, Queen Rudo's descendant and their people came back. They reclaimed their old home after tens of thousands of years being torn away from it. After being forced to adapt in the oceans bordering Hyrule for so long, their physical appearance has drastically shifted to appear like the vastly diverse sea life you'd only find in the ocean, such as sharks, dolphins, manta rays, and whales. 
Although not 100% resistant to the sun's rays, these aura have been shown to have a much higher tolerance going without water for long durations, even sometimes wishing for the sun to shine upon their backs. Traits that the other Zora in the timeline do not demonstrate. Now it's all starting to make sense how Sidon can be Rudo's descendant. Now it finally makes sense what happened to the Rito. Now we know why the Koroks and the Wind Waker are 100% identical to the ones we see in Breath of the Wild and Tears of the Kingdom. Even the description for Rock Salt makes more sense. Does this theory actually confirm that Breath of the Wild and Tears of the Kingdom take place in the adult timeline somehow? Unfortunately, I still think that's not exactly the case. The games are more than likely just reboots of the series after the timelines have converged at some point, but it's still very interesting to think about. So many questions at long last have potentially finally been answered, and it only took us about, uh, uh 20 years. Man, I love Zelda games. A special thanks goes out to Charles W., a brand new YouTube member on this channel. Really appreciate your support. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed yourself, there is much more to come in the future, so please, subscribe and stick around for another onslaught of Zelda lore from Gossip Geist.